What's up, party people, and welcome back to another episode of NYC Foodways, your weekly food and culture discussion from the cultural capital of the world. My name is John, and this week's episode is dedicated to radical farmer Jose Bove, who got so bent out of shape when a McDonald's appeared in his small French town that he destroyed it with his bulldozer. Your local elected official could never. Have you ever felt out of touch, like the world went and got itself in a big damn hurry? That things became different overnight and you just weren't okay with it? That, to paraphrase Grandpa Simpson, used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what you're with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to you. George W.S. Tro knows the feeling, or maybe he's just trolling. Or maybe he knows the feeling and he's trolling. I'll leave it up for you to decide after you finish reading his difficult-to-categorize book within the context of no context. Originally published in a special issue of The New Yorker, so special that it was the only reporting printed that week, which puts it in the same league as John Hersey's Hiroshima, format-wise, and I learned after reading it about as far away from John Hersey's Hiroshima, stylistically and content-wise, as possible. We are all products of our environment, it is said, though perhaps George W. S. Tro more so than most. Born in 1943 to a rich white family of rich white publishing executives in the rich white part of Connecticut, Tro received the richest, whitest East Coast education imaginable at Exeter and Harvard. In 1966, shortly after graduation, he got a job at the New Yorker, which I'm certain he did on his own merits. For decades, he wrote frequently in those pages and had a number of books published as well. But the culture shift of the 60s and 70s did something to this very establishment man, something challenging, something alienating. And in November of the year of our Lord 1980, George W. S. Tro fired back against the forces of debauchery that had degraded his comfortable establishment world. Okay. I should stop here to say that I almost titled this one Unholy Writ because of how outlandish much of what Tro says in the book seems to me today. But I ultimately considered it worthy of the Holy Writ header, not in and of itself, but rather because of, of what it represents for a certain set of New Yorkers and a certain set of New York, along with a particularly quaint ideology and one man who held fast to that ideology, or perhaps hated it, or more likely both. A normie book reviewer would probably describe within the context of no context as a critique of the effects of television on the American cultural landscape, and to a certain extent, that's true. Tro hates television and spends much of the book whining about how all of his favorite cultural reference, mainly the First and Second World Wars, and their resultant contextualizing of American post-war culture had been erased by the crass nature of his bête noire, the television set. Television's rise to ubiquity in the 50s was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad thing, we are told repeatedly. A child watching television, Tro writes, will not encounter a discussion of how he might marry or how he might work, but he will find material relating to how he should be honest in coming to terms with his divorce, and he will encounter much material that has the source of its energy, his confusion, and unhappiness. Okay, boomer. This book is important not because it is important, it isn't, but because of what is said by someone from a group that was once important, but thankfully no longer is. Let me explain, or rather, let Tro explain. I was born into the upper middle class in 1943, and one of the strange turns my life has taken is this. I was taught by my parents to believe that the traditional manners of the high bourgeoisie, properly acquired, would give me a certain dignity, which would protect me from embarrassment. It has turned out that I am able to do almost anything but act according to those modes. This because I deeply believe that those modes are suffused with an embarrassment so powerful that it can kill. Here he is openly acknowledging the hollow artifice of his elite station in life, and how the power that used to flow through it is largely passé, but there is a longing here too. A longing for a before time that likely never existed, at least not for more than a few thousand moneyed families, if that. Proving our fair city, just like ourselves, contains multitudes. This guy yearns for a bygone New York, but a very different bygone New York than the one I yearn for. New York of 1957 was, Tro writes, 
The New York of Rodgers and Hammerstein in the country of Eisenhower, the military industrial complex and the Ivy League style. We were war winners and we had responsibilities. What on earth is he talking about? Could there be a more facile description of a city of seven and a half million? And really, the Ivy League style? Does anyone else think he is, as they say in New Zealand, taking a piss? Tro is the type of writer to use the phrase hard scrabble law school, which is either the most out of touch thing uttered by anyone since Marie Antoinette or the perfect sly parody of what a rich person would call getting a JD from anywhere other than the Ivies. Maybe it's both. I have a sneaking suspicion Tro knows it's all yet it's his set's so he has to defend it to an extent. But his defense of the way things were is only part of within the context of no context. Much more ink is spilled here attacking the way things are, namely awful, silly, also transfixing. He can't stop writing about them. And don't get him started on punk rock. This guy laments what progress has wrought and eliminated, but while this channel likewise does so from the bottom up, he is most definitely doing so from the top down. The problem with books like these is that they are so rooted in their own narrow temporality that when we revisit them 40 odd years later, they are hopelessly, painfully out of date. Criticizing television in the current year when we carry screens affixed to our hands and legs is absurd. However, I do think that the criticism of the TV aesthetic is valuable as an artifact, if nothing else. An artifact of what made rich establishment media people sad. This book's not all bad, though. There are some fairly direct anti-advertising and anti-capitalist messages sprinkled about, which are as refreshing as they are jarring. The guy really was at odds with himself. He also makes a few interesting points about New York, including this gem I will share here in full, where Tro is discussing a recent book review in the New York Times. The woman was talking about New York City. Her idea had been that the revolution would bring better parks to New York, and beautiful places to live, and daycare centers, and hospices. Her idea was that New York should be human, now, this is simply a mistake. New York is an inhuman machine put together to serve the most ambitious interests of a certain part of American secular society. It has human aspects because human needs must be met before ambitions can proceed toward realization, but the fulfillment of those human needs is an uninteresting precondition of the life of the ambitions. In human terms, there is no reason to live in New York, and if New York were to become a city in which daycare centers and hospices were the dominant institutions, it would soon be depopulated. What he's saying here, and I agree with him, is that, so humanized, New York would be depopulated of its inhuman element, the ghoulish bankers, the insectoid real estate development hive mind, the zombie brunchers. If the 70s were bad enough to make Tro write a book-length essay on how what it is seems weird and scary, the 80s must have been something terrible. By the time 1994 rolled around and then New Yorker editor, editor Tina Brown brought in Roseanne Barr to curate a special issue on women, Tro had had enough. He hung up his fedora that he loved and also was embarrassed by, talk about existential pain, and quit the magazine in protest. I actually sort of feel bad for the guy, a man in love with, tortured by, resentful of, bitter towards, and thankful for his comfortable place in the world. Maybe he and I aren't so different after all. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week for another episode of NYC Foodways. Peace.